Okay, can you hear me? Can you hear me at the back? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, I was just saying to uh, two people at the front there, for a long time when I lectured here, uh, I have a PhD in maths, so I used to teach in the maths department here. The, uh, there were some students always sat at the back, and in, it was quite a small class, about 30 in it. And in the third year, they came and sat at the front, which is really quite noticeable because they've been at the back all the time. I just asked them, why are you at the front now? They said, well, we could never hear you properly at the back. But it took them three years to figure that out. So if you're at the back and you can't hear anything, move forward. Or if you're too embarrassed to do it now, make sure you're near the front. You know, get the most out of the lectures. I'm uh, John Brinkman. I'm going to talk roughly about industry education and training. Uh, as just said then, I, before I ever went to university, I, I worked for a lot of different industries, so I know quite a bit about them. I've also, well, I set up the business school here. We didn't have one at the university. I'm a dean now, and uh, universities are full of lots of different names, but uh, a dean usually means somebody that doesn't do much lecturing and you get wheeled out to do different bits and pieces now and again, and that's what I'm doing today. It's quite interesting that... Uh, there's an awful lot we have now that we take for granted that's really only just happened over the last probably 200 years. So I'm going to say a little bit about that and about some of the social issues with it as well. And if you uh, stop me about 10 minutes before the end so we can have those questions, yeah, I'll try and get some questions in. Okay, we're going to have a little look at uh, industry education and training, why they're linked, and why we need them, both morally and economically. So industry now, but it wasn't always like this, big changes 200 years ago, massive changes, needs people who are education and trained. You know, sometimes... Uh, Possibly being a dean as you get rolled into other environments. Uh, I can be down talking to a government minister and I have to convince them about the training. And they don't understand it. So they don't understand the differences. You know, and do we need industry? Might be a good question at the start. You know, what does it matter? Well, obviously it matters. You know, industry made that, that, that. I mean, just look around you. Everything in the room comes from industry. If we go back, uh, well, 50 years, my parents uh, certainly couldn't afford a car. You know, go back 100 years, probably never seen a car. But we can all have them now, or we have access to them, because industry's got hold of it and can make them a lot cheaper. So there's some benefits there. There's always costs with that, but there's some benefits to it. Obviously, the better we can make industry, the better we'll all be as a society. So we've got to make it better, but to make it better you need people. Because it doesn't matter what we make, we need some people involved in it. Uh, in the 70s I worked uh, in Birmingham at Longbridge, there's a big car plant there, if anybody's from Birmingham they'll remember it, it's closed now. Well, it's not closed actually, uh, it's taken over and uh, sort of started off again. And they started bringing the robots in. And of course if you weren't there you'd be very worried about losing your job. However, at the other end of it, it makes the cars a lot cheaper. But you still need somebody to make that robot. You still need other people around the infrastructure. And the idea is, and this is a great idea from Adam Smith, who was uh, one of the first uh, economists. He was also a lecturer at uh, Glasgow University. And in his day, you only got paid as a lecturer by the students in the class. If they liked you on the way out, they'd put money in. You're a bag. If they didn't like you, they wouldn't. It was quite a good uh, student feedback. But you don't have it anymore, but for him it was quite effective. So he did something called... Uh, looked at moral welfare. 
And he really said, well, industry is great and competition is great because we all benefit at the end. And if you don't have that, we don't benefit. What are some issues there? So let's assume that we need industry. Should we be concerned about training? Well, yeah, I think we should. I'm going to say, well, for the purpose of this lecture, that the most important people we have to train are managers. Managers didn't exist 200 years ago. We'll come back to that in a moment. Because they can and do have the biggest impact on an organisation. And the education faculty should realise, I mean, often talks to Bart about this, but the people who make a dramatic difference in a school are the heads, dramatically. There's no doubt about that. So managers have the biggest impact on an organisation. And we'll look a bit more closely at that. Let's just think about it for a minute. 200 years ago, there was no industry the way we have it now. If you wanted to make a pot, for example, you would make it in your own home. You'd go and get the clay, you'd harden it, you'd paint it, then you'd sell it on to somebody. And that person, used to be a guy walk, going around on a horse usually, picking a few up and then going selling them at the local fair, that person would do everything. A guy called Wedgwood came along. He was one of a few. Henry Ford gets a lot of credit for this, but it was Wedgwood in the uh, potteries who did it. He started to take people in to what we now call a factory. It wasn't called a factory then. So he'd bring them into one place. And his idea, which was building on Adam Smith, which is why I mentioned Adam Smith before, was that, okay, instead of you making individually your pot, I'm going to get you to do the moulding, you to do the hardening of it, you to do the painting, etc. So he had a little production line. And the potteries has got all going through it canals. And the boats used to come in, drop off the clay, but go around this little production line, come out at the other end as uh, pots, cups, whatever. And they were making a lot more than they ever could. So bringing them together meant that instead of 10 people making one a day, 10 people were probably making 100 a day. And when you hear the word shop floor, that's exactly where it came from. Because people took what was their own shop into this one place. And that was Wedgwood's idea. So shop floor comes from that. So that was great. So the people themselves could earn more money. Wedgwood made a lot of money, and so did others. But it had some benefit. So you start to get this production line idea going. Didn't have managers then. We had owners. Wedgwood was the owner. Of course, when Wedgwood's making a bit of money there, the next thing he wants to do is set up another enterprise exactly the same, somewhere near it. So again, another 10 people coming in. They'll be walking around, doing the same thing, another 100 coming out. And he wants to open up another factory, as we're now starting to call it. His problem starts to be that in one place, he's the owner-manager. So he goes in and knows exactly what's going on. When he's got a few other places going on, he needs somebody in there to look after it. So for the first time, you start to need somebody who's a manager, who's not the owner, which is a different thing, so somebody who's going to manage it for you. You're going to pay them a wage. So, of course, I want the best person I can get. And that then started off a whole lot of research everywhere. Nobody had ever thought of it that way before. There was no need to. Because it was the owners themselves who were looking after it. They didn't have these other places to look at. 
So there's a big change then came from 200 years ago. <coughs> Oops. Yeah, one of my roles was uh, teaching in the computer science department for a few years when I was sorting that out. And I'm absolutely useless with this stuff, I can tell you. I can't even put the video on at home, so uh, hopefully something will pop out here. Uh, going to uh, have a couple of clips. One of, the, one of them is about Patience Kershaw. It's quite interesting. If you're doing anything about sociology or look back, you can search your name out. She was somebody that uh, went... This, quite famous, there's, people started to look at conditions in factories. I'd not had to look at it before. It didn't exist. People used to do their own thing. When they're brought together in a factory, everything changed, conditions changed. So then some of the people started to look into that and say, probably a bit like the, uh, some of the factory conditions now out in Asia. Didn't have controls. We didn't have controls 200 years ago. A factory clock came because nobody had a clock or a watch. So the whistle came because they needed everybody there at that one time to get the production line going. Then you get a whole series of rules set up about that. It hadn't happened before. People had to change the way they were doing things. But then people started to be taken advantage of. So Patience, uh, which you'll see in the clip in a minute, she was, uh, she was interviewed. And her job was down in the mine. And what, uh, what she had to do every day was take the trolley down to the men working in the mine. They'd fill it up with coal and she'd push it back out. And she's a young girl, about 18, 19. And what's happening, of course, is she's developing these muscles everywhere. Every time she pushes it back out, she's got her head down against it, trying to push it because of the weight, so she's starting to go bald. And she's really getting upset about the way she looks. She's sort of, you know, she's starting to look like one of the boys, you know, one of the men. If she doesn't do it, she doesn't eat. It's the bottom line for her. But also, when she gets to the inside, of course, the guys working down in the coal are stripped off. It's red hot down there, you know, in a coal mine. So they're stripped off, and she's got all that embarrassment. But if she's sick, which of course easily happens once a month, she's not feeling great, they'll hit her if she's not working fast enough because their wages and their family are relying on what they get out. That's how they're getting paid. So the environment was completely different, and people were in that. There was no other system. That was it. You either worked there or you didn't. So we had this great social good happening, and on the other hand, we had these different conditions. Let me just look at a little bit of a clip. So anything going to happen here? Hi, I'm Evan, and right now we are going to discuss the effect... <coughs> okay. Try to be respected. 
Okay, so life wasn't so great then. Still lots of benefits coming out, but uh, if you're at that end of it, it's not great. And uh, I couldn't find out what happened to patients. And whether she got past 30, I'd be surprised. Lots of people like her then. So, we've got different systems, good or bad. Obviously, bits of bad there. Lots of benefits. But well, we could be getting some benefit from this that was made under those same conditions in Sri Lanka or somewhere now. But we're still getting benefits from it. And we do that because we're a wealthy country. Well, are we better off because of management? We've got to manage them somehow. You know, we've got these different places. There's probably, I don't know, 3 or 4% of the population control probably about 85% of everything that goes through wealth-wise. And they're not going to risk it on people they don't trust. So they need good managers. And let's get it right, they need managers to make money. That's why they're doing it. A byproduct of that is that we get different things out of it. But if we don't have it, what could we replace it with? You know, there's nothing else comes to mind. Well, how did it start? We've just seen that. And the big change was the Industrial Revolution. But people thought, thought differently about things then. When Henry Ford came along to do a car that everybody could afford, he famously brought farm laborers off. Farms paid them more money just to do one simple job. Before he did that, building a car was the most skilled thing you could do. And typically, five, six, seven people would get together in a garage and build a car. So one car was different to another car. It's a little bit like uh, computer science industry now. Very highly skilled. But even in computer science now, you get people working on one bit of a program, another person working on another bit and putting it together. And that's what happened with cars. It sort of de-skilled it. It'll happen with computing as well. I just haven't got there yet. So it brought them all together. But it was a different world. You couldn't, certainly if you're a woman, you couldn't be a manager. And if you weren't white in the Western world, you couldn't be a manager. And Kellogg's, one of the big industrialists, did lots of different things, but Kellogg's used to advertise their cereal. It was the cereal for the white working man. I didn't think anybody else could work or had anything about them. So there was a whole attitude of things around then. But people were still keen on what makes a good manager? Because if I could find that out, I'll make more money. In fact, if I could find it out as a country, that'd be great because I could make a better country. Why would I not want the best manager, stroke leader, and head of the country? They're going to make all the right decisions, and we'd be better off because of that. So all of a sudden, people started looking very carefully at management and what makes a good manager, because they're so influential. So, I'll just say what we mean by it for a few seconds. It's been around for a long time, but not in the same way. Because the person who built the pyramids was the pharaoh. Yeah. Certainly get it together, get people together, I'll kill you if you don't get it finished. You know, it was like a different kind of thing, and armies. But not the same way now we have different people going around. Looking after somebody else's money is really what they're doing. 
Henry Fayol was the first one really to sort of look at it in an academic way. And he laid out 14 principles of management. Trying to generalize what a manager did, because nobody really understood it. It was this new thing. Look after my money in that factory. In fact, uh, accountancy came out then, because the, uh, somebody like Wedgwood might have had 15 factories. If you asked him how much money he had, he had no idea. Because when the clay comes in, does he count it then as an asset, or do you count it when it goes out the other end? Also, how does he control the managers who he'd put in place? How does he know that he's not fiddling their money? So accountancy was set up in that period as well. A lot of things came out in the last 100 years, all because of this different style of working. So Henry sort of uh, put this down. I'm very proud of him in France. Every uh, January, I get asked to go to Lyon's big university there where I do some stuff on him. And I'm very proud of him. But he was one of the first ones to think about it. We're not very good in general about thinking about problems. We tend to sort of go along until the problem hits us in the face. He was somebody who stood back from it and just started to look at it differently. What does all this mean? And it was the original term. And if you ever hear uh, MBA, it's because administration and management, the same thing in France. Also goes back to uh, controlling horses. If you look at the uh, root of the word. So another video. Just stop it there for a minute. This one at first, the same people just starting to think about it. Frederick Taylor started to really look at how you did jobs. So you look at absolutely everything. So it didn't matter what it was, he looked at a brick layer, picking up a brick, putting the uh, sand and cement on it, laying it. And he told him how to do it differently, to pick it up differently. And that's how they do it now. And that's all he did was watch somebody laying bricks and said, well, if you do it this way, you'll save so many seconds here. It was very, very scientific about what he did. So Taylor's sort of famous for that, but it's just somebody who came in and started to look at something differently and stood outside. So that's why Taylor gets a mention here.
security system that rivals most nuclear missile silos. First, we have to get within the casino cages, which anybody will tell you takes more than a smile. Next, through these doors. I know more about casinos than you Okay, I'm going to stop on commanding because it sort of links back to the start. The first guy I, we had on was an American version of uh, Alex Ferguson, sort of shouting fear. Does that work as a manager? Hmm? Certainly works for Alex Ferguson, doesn't it? Hmm? What you need to strip from your minds, which is very hard, is what's nice and what makes money. I remember these managers are put in place to make money. And it's very nice if you can have uh, lots of nice words that go with it. So it's all about teamwork, and goals, you know, what are the goals of the organization. They're all inclusive words, but they're there to make money. The best performing minds in the world ever have been in South Africa. Terrible conditions because it was when apartheid was at its height and people would be getting beaten up down there. Now some societies can live with that and some societies can't. But if you're talking about management, what do you want management to do? If you're a Manchester United fan, you probably want that bit of fear that Ferguson's got on the team. The team might not like it too much, but it's one way of doing it. There's all of the bits that go with it as well. Organizing, getting somewhere on time, making sure things arrive. And you need to make that happen. I have over 100 uh, staff in the faculty. I'm sure if I said, you know, well, turn up on Monday morning if you like, some would and some wouldn't. You say, no, I want you here at 9 o'clock Monday morning, but they're at 9 o'clock. Same for you. A lot of you will have part time jobs. You need some fear, whether it's money or whatever it is, to make that happen. And getting that balance is very difficult. But I uh, just want to leave some time for questions. So commanding is quite difficult. We do a police management degree. You won't realize this, but it's the only one in the country. It's police leadership, so they send the fast-track officers onto it. So I often talk to the chief constable about this, about... You know, we can do fear or command, but how do you do it? How do you motivate somebody? Because if I'm an officer, if I'm a police constable, <coughs> excuse me, and I'm on a stakeout, say, for example, and I know so there's a hostage in there, I'm here to do my eight-hour shift, I've got a gun here, do I pop my head around the corner to get shot at, or do I just stand here with the gun, because in eight hours I'll get... Somebody else will come in, I'll give them the gun, I'll go home, that's my shift done. What motivates them to do something else? What motivates people in the army to do that bit extra? What motivates somebody in a company? Because if you can get them in a company to do something extra, it's much better. It'll go much better. The company will make more money. So motivation's quite a big issue. It's different in different people. What motivated me at 18 doesn't motivate me now. So it's not just different people. Within the same person, motivation is different. So management's difficult because of that. But it's a real question for management. And there's much more we could go into there, but I need to leave some questions for you. And there's a whole lot about that later. So I'm open to questions or challenges or 
anything for the next 15 minutes, I think we have, don't we? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is quite novel that it's come. I've been interviewed on the TV before, but where it's happened, but I haven't had it in a lecture before. So. I've got one question here. Yeah, I don't know um, what you think about it. It is uh, if managers are so important, uh, who would? Uh, uh, why doesn't our prime minister have received ongoing training? Oh, yeah. yeah, interesting question, yeah. Try and tell a politician they need any training, they won't have it. We're one of the few countries in the world, America's the same actually, we're not quite as bad, that will take, I don't know, the current minister for education and we'll swap them around and put them in charge of transport tomorrow. Just have a cabinet reshuffle. Absolutely no background in transport. So why don't they have training? There's only one president had any management training, and that was George Bush. So I'm not sure that's a convincing <laughs> argument. Yeah. So uh, if we could, though, if we go back to that question, if I could find out somebody, if I could just tell by characteristics of somebody in the 20s who was going to be a good manager, and I could take them out and spend 10 or 15 years training them, that would be much better for the country. What I can't find are those characteristics. Nobody in universities can. You can be short and very authoritative. You can be six foot five and have no authority with people. There's lots of different parts come into it. So it's a good question, but uh, no easy answer. No. Uh, yeah, that's one, one of the questions that came through here. I have one for you. Um, how do we reconcile the making money and being moral? I think uh, for me I reconcile it because I like to be comfortable. When, uh, I mean I do other things as well that I think counterbalance that but that's uh, not really for here. We have a research center in India, actually have, we have three research centers in India, there's two from our faculty that we support some people there and we do other things as well. But it's funny, we look at, it glo we look at that question globally now and say, well, we have this, they don't have that. But my father, when he was at school, he was going to school with children who had no shoes. So, I mean, my father's dead now, but it's not that long ago. When we were the richest country in the world, with the empire, you know, two-thirds of the world we controlled, it's only five tenths of cents of people had that money. Most people in here, the families didn't have it. What industry's done is given some of those riches to us. And that's starting to happen now in India and starting to happen in some Asian countries, more so than before. And it's quite a moral question, isn't it? Because uh, I, I have a colleague in Bangalore that uh, I do some work with. It's quite a moral question. I say to him, look, why don't I stop Marks and Spencer's you know, buying stuff here, or why don't I stop that company? He'll say to me, if you do that, my village will starve because there will be no money at all coming in. So, it's not quite as straightforward what I do. I can put pressure on them to pay them more, but it's really quite difficult. And in fact, there's some challenges there that, uh, if I go right back to Adam Smith, he said about markets evening them out. China was the place for cheap manufacturing. It's not quite as cheap now because their internal costs have gone up. In another five years, China won't have that advantage anymore. The same thing will start to happen in India. As their economy changes, that will happen again. It will be somewhere else. So things... when. It, the Indian economy and the Chinese economy are improving and the wages are improving as well. So you do get some kind of leverage coming up. But believe me, when I go into India and I go around some of the places that we do some work in, there are some very poor parts in India. If uh, I, I say this to my children, but your children never hear what you say. You might hear it. In India, there are something like 1,500 million people. 
Nobody knows them. They don't have national insurance numbers the way we have. There's lots of people living rough. Around 1,500 million people. Around 360 to 400 million people are very well educated and very rich. The rest, which is over a you know, thousand million, have got absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. But in Europe, we do not have 360 rich, well educated people. And the threat to the UK economy from one country, never mind China or somewhere else, and the skills that they have is really one that's going to hit home in the next 5, 10, 15 years. Your job over the next few years is to get those skills because they're going to bypass you. We might have 100 million well-educated in Europe. We certainly haven't got 100 million wealthy ones. So there's challenges there. There's challenges coming from the rest of the world. Okay. Okay. How do you make something based on efficiency, like the industry, even more efficient? Ah, right, okay, yeah. Efficiency is, uh, when you're at university, you should worry very much about words. Efficiency is not the same as effectiveness. I could be the most efficient, I don't know, what can, do something you can see here, uh, sawing a log. Very efficient action, very smooth. I might be more effective if I sharpen the blade and just did it a bit quicker. So being effective is not the same as being efficient. If you do both, that's fine. So what you want is industries to be even more effective and more effective. But there's a lot of people make a lot of money worrying about that. Because if there is a way, they'll find it. I worry more about the benefits coming out from that into society. <laughs> Okay, I'll stop there. Probably got into your lunchtime. Thank you very much. Thank you.